Please stand. I can't resist. Welcome to my world. Uh, please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Truro Cathedral, one of Cornwall's most significant places, as we gather to say farewell to one of Cornwall's uh, most significant people of recent times. We are gathering as people have gathered almost throughout human history at the end of a person's life. And as is the way of this place, we will bid that farewell to some extent in rite and in ritual. Along the way, we will give thanks for the life of Jethro, or Jethro if you prefer, 
and we will hear a good deal about his life and his loves, a fair few memories about him, and no doubt, a fair few stories about him. For me, I came across him twice in my life. The first time was close to 35 years ago, when I saw him at the salubrious surroundings of the Hale Masonic Hall, probably not long before he became really well known. I remember it mainly because I had one of those dread moments where a call of nature was going to cause me to have to stand up before a comic doing his stuff. And I knew that I would not survive that unscathed. I remember them bringing my not slight frame to its full height and the words that then followed. Mother Standina grow bag, did she? He said. Which, uh, if you're not Cornish, did your mother stand you in a grow bag? Okay. Our second encounter was a much quieter one, well over ten years later, on the boundary edge at Lewdown Cricket Club. I was playing for Calstock, and I must have been chatting with him for about twenty minutes before I even realised who he was. Just an ordinary bloke watching a game that he loved. I'm sure in the time we spend here, many more memories will fill this place. And we will hear a fair few more from the friends who will speak about him. And they will help represent all the various memories that you bring here to this place today. As we give thanks for all of that, we come also on these occasions with those who at this time feel the real pain of losing him, feeling that pain really quite harshly. We stand then today with Jenny and his children and the wider family and his close friends in a simple act of common human solidarity as we gather here. We remember them in our thoughts and prayers at this service and we offer our continued support of them in the days and the weeks that are yet to come. Finally, we acknowledge that this is a sacred place, a place that has just remembered again the coming of Jesus at Christmas. He brings with him a message of hope the hope that the faith that he had and the life that he lived could not be condemned to darkness and meaninglessness in death, but would rather find new light and purpose in the presence of his heavenly Father. Many have since followed in his stead and have sought in various ways to place their feet in the footsteps he trod before them. And they also find this gift of hope. Those of you who gather here, who were closest to Jethro, know the most about all that he offered and gave to your lives. The person that he was, and the things that were important to him. And it is for those great things that we give our thanksgivings here today. I hope in many ways at the same time that some of that can form a foundation of hope for you as well. The hope that though perhaps taken too soon, he has now found rest and peace, resting in the presence of a loving and a gracious God. Let us pray. God of all consolation, your son Jesus Christ was moved to tears at the grave of Lazarus, his friend. Look with compassion today on all your children in their loss. Give to troubled hearts the light of hope. 
and strengthen in each one of us the gift of faith. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now I'm going to hand over to the Reverend Tim Hodge, and he's going to read a little part of the Bible to us. Tim. Thank you very much indeed, Canon Allen. I've got to say this, Jenny. Jethro will be so proud of all his family, how well they look, especially you, Jenny. I know underneath that, that coat, you've got the best dress, the most beautiful dress in the whole cathedral. Well, second best. I'm now going to share, in Jethro's honour, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guardeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, and yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my foes. Ye anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you know, from the moment I knew Jethro had passed away, I felt absolutely compelled to share Psalm 23 in Jethro's honour, because the psalm sings about the whole of life. It's not just about the dying to it. And through it, the psalmist reminds us that no matter what we're going through in life, whether it's good or bad, happy, or sad, we are never, ever alone. God, the psalmist tells us, is with us every step of the way, and that is true, but we can't see God, and we probably won't feel God, and by golly, there is times in all of our lives we think to ourselves, just where on earth are you? But God, I think the best word is godliness, comes alongside each and every one of us, through the people that love and care for us. But it also comes alongside us with the people, the unique people that have the ability to put a smile on our faces and laughter on our lips no matter how down we're feeling. A unique person such as Jethro, by golly, he could make us smile. He could make us laugh, could he not? No matter what. But as I said, it's more than that. It's about the people who care and love for us, our friends, our family, and by golly, family, the most important element in Jethro's whole life. And on that note, we all share Jethro's prayer. Let us pray. Creator of all life, you love everybody that you have made. In your mercy, turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life and turn the sorrow of parting into the joy of happy memories. And we pray in Jethro's memory. We pray for Jenny, for Jess, Lanyon, and Sarah. We pray for all of Jethro's grandchildren, because by golly, he loves each and every one of you. And we pray for all in the extended family, all the good friends made throughout Jethro's life, and for all of his fans, and Jeffro's hope for all of us is that we enjoy good health, peace, and happiness. Oh, and he'd say, I want fun in my funeral. Amen to that. I had to say about the fun in funeral because I'll, I'll be honest with you, Jeffro's been to, to quite a few funerals. And, and to be honest, he, he thinks a few of them are a weeny bit boring. And he always said, look, what's the, th the first three letters in the word funeral? F-U-N. Fun. So let's have some fun. And I know the fun will come later on. But now I share eulogy on Jethro's family's behalf. 
Jethro was born Geoffrey McIntyre Rowe on the 8th of March 1948, born in St Bunyan, the youngest of four sons to Miriam and Hugh. Now, Dad Hugh was a farm manager at Trenanic Mill Farm Sacred. Now, he grew up near Tender School in St Creed and later went to St Just. On leaving school, Jethro served his time as carpenter's apprentice with Mr Eddie. But in his spare time, he joined the St Just Operatic and Dramatic Society, and of course his love of performing and singing that soon became very apparent. Of course, mining was a big way of life down in West Cornwall all around that time, and due to Jeff's carpentry skills, he got a job as a timberman working down Levant Tin Mine. And that was one job that Jethro was most proud of. And years on, he still told many stories of working underground. Now, Jethro was a keen member of the Madron Young Farmers. And he would be seen at many a rally winning prizes for the sheaf pitching. He absolutely excelled in that. And he still holds the Champions Cup to this day, I understand. Actually, Jethro was well known for his competitive side especially that would be seen in sports such as rugby and clay pigeon shooting. He played rugby from 1967 as a prop forward for Penzance Pirates. He played over 100 games alongside England player Stack Stevens. And later on, Jethro would play for the Camels at Wadebridge and he captained the Commandos. But sadly, Jethro's rugby career was brought to an abrupt end after sustaining a fractured cheekbone. And as I mentioned, clay pigeon shooting, that was one of his many loves. And after many years of shooting at a very good competitive level, Jethro rose to England standard scores, and he actually won the English Open in 1990. And he made many appearances as part of the Cornwall team. And his passion for shooting eventually led him to build his own shooting ground at his farm near Lifton on the Devon Cornwall border, and that was called the Two Counties Gun Club, and that still remains open to this very day. After leaving St Just, Jeffro then moved to St Wen near Wadebridge, and he was blessed by two sons, Jess and Lanyon. And both boys were very smart, were very well behaved, never caused their parents any problems. Who wrote this? Now at this time, Jethro was building by day, and in the evenings he was working in pubs, singing, and he'd tell the odd humorous story. And anyone who knows Jethro knows what a very strong work ethic he's always had. And then he worked day and night, and that became the norm to him. Gradually, Jethro's stories developed, and with his natural flair of comedy, and Jethro the Comedian was born. Mr. Davidson, Jim, will tell you more about Jethro's comedy career later on in the service, of course. Now, 1983, special year, Jethro met his life partner, Jenny, moved in with her and her daughter, Sarah, in Liscard. Come 1989, Jethro's career had soared and they decided to relocate to Devon and they bought the old service station in Down and they turned it into the now renowned club known as Jethro's. Jethro continued to work day and night. And once the club was established, he resurrected his passion for horses. In 1994, he bought his first horse, and that was the beginning of Jethro's bloodstock, breeding, producing prize-winning stock. At his peak, Jethro owned over a hundred show and race horses, and they were all kept on Jethro's site in a stable yard that he actually built himself. Now, some of the successes he gained was winning the Hunter Classes at the Horse of the Year show and the Queen's Cup seven times at the Royal Cornwall show. Now, I've got to say this because this could be quite surprising to the outside world. Jethro was a home bird. Or well, we'd all realise how proud he was of his West Country roots. And no matter where he worked throughout the whole country, he always made sure he came back home. 
Oh, he wasn't one for holidays. He was actually convinced once by Jenny to go on holiday, and they went to the Algarve in Portugal. Now, while away, he searched the Algarve top to bottom for a pasty shop. Then boredom took over, and because of Jethro's work ethic, he decided to go and help lay paving slabs on the building site next to the hotel they were staying in. But Jen, I think I am right in saying that he did actually find the one and only pasty shop in the whole of Portugal, didn't he? <laughs> as well as having a real hard work ethic, Jethro was a shrewd businessman. He invested his hard-earned money in various farms throughout Devon and Cornwall. He was actively involved in the farms right up until his final days. And a very charitable gent. Jethro supported many charities throughout his life. And in 1995, he walked with a group of friends from Land's End to Ludown. Oh, many other people joined him along the way, of course. Each night, he stopped at another venue to put on a show to raise more money for the Bristol Open Scanner Appeal. He also arranged large amounts for After Combat Charity and, of course, the Children's Hospice Southwest, and, and that's just a few of the charities he, he worked so hard to support. They closed the club down in 2011 and then eventually moved into a house in the heart of the village in Ludown. And that's where he continued to do his theatre tours. But on days off, he liked to potter in the garden. He'd visit the local pub for a pint. He'd sit at home in an evening, listen to Jim Reeves. Oh, and he made his own slow gin. It was 2019 that he announced his retiring tour. But due to this COVID, of course, it was postponed. But... Every cloud has a silver lining. And this meant that he had quality time to spend with Jenny, his children, the grandchildren, the last two years of his life, cherished moments. And throughout his whole life, Jethro always, and I mean always, strived for perfection in every single thing he did. And by golly, he did not suffer fools gladly. Oh, he was such a well-loved, cantankerous character. A gent who will be sorely missed by all of his family, his friends, and all of his fans alike. We're going to miss Jethro terribly. But now, in his honour, we are all going to stand to sing a wonderful hymn, The Old Rugged Cross, and I am so, so grateful Thank you to the Oggy Men for joining us. Jethro arranged the Oggy Men to be here because he's heard all of you lot sing before, hasn't he? Please stand for the Old Rugged Cross.
Thank you very much indeed, the Oggy men. Please be seated as I hand over to Mr. John Miles, MBE. Thank you, John. How lucky was I to have known Jethro for over 40 years. He was such a special friend to me, as I know he was to all of you. He was a brilliant comedian and one of the most talented who brought so much comedy through live shows, TV, radio, videos and DVDs with his wonderful stories helped a little by Denzel Pemberthy and Slip Along. Jethro started by singing in pubs in Cornwall, then told a couple of his funny stories, which everyone loved. He gradually stopped singing and concentrated on comedy. His fame gradually spread to the rest of the country, uh, thanks to the help of TV appearances on Desert Connor and of course, Jim Davison having him no less than five times on his generation game. Fame never changed Jethro. He would talk to royalty the same as he spoke to the newspaper boy. He appeared for Prince Charles numerous times to raise funds for the Beaufort Hunt and also private events for Prince Charles and also the Queen. I remember receiving a call from the Queen's representative at Ascot saying, Her Royal Highness the Queen, one evening in a couple of weeks' time, is visiting Ascot Racecourse to look at the new stand with 17 of her friends, including Princess Margaret. And would Jethro agree to come along and tell a few of his lovely stories? When the Queen and her friends returned to the main reception room, at Jethro, at first, Jethro thought it was a joke, but it took a lot of convincing to uh, get him to agree it was true. The week before the appearance for the Queen, we met Prince Charles, and Jethro mentioned he was going to perform a small show for the Queen the following week and Prince Charles looked in horror. It was horror-stricken, knowing of his stories. But Jethro said, don't worry, I think I can clean up a few of my stories, which he did, and the evening was a great success. On another occasion, Prince Charles asked Jethro if he had bought any more land in Cornwall, which Jethro replied, yes. Prince Charles joked, I think you, own, own, you now own more land in Cornwall than me. Jethro loved his family, Jess, Lanny and Sarah, Tracy and his grandchildren. And the love of his life was of course Jenny, who was quite often the butt of his jokes. When I rang Jethro, I would often ask, how is Jenny? And he'd always joke, She's okay, but she still smells of spore figa. <laughs> but not that, of course that's not true. He loved to be mischievous, and I remember Andy, Andy Reid, who drove Jethro all over the country to shows for many years, rang me one morning and said he'd been stopped last night by police for speeding. Uh, driving Jethro back from a show. The officer said to Andy, you were speeding. And Andy replied, well, it was only a few miles over the limit, officer. Jethro's, Jethro was pretending to be asleep in the passenger seat, seat with his cap pulled down over his face, unrecognized by the officer. And while poor Andy was trying to plead and defend himself, Jethro said from under his cap, you know, officer, 
He sometimes does 95 miles an hour, and I'm always telling him to stop. The police eventually recognized it was Jethro, and after a few Denzel Penworthy stories, they sent Jethro and Andy on their way. Jethro was a good businessman and very shrewd. I'm sure he'll be looking down on us at this moment in this lovely cathedral and thinking, if everyone had paid £20 a ticket, what would the profit have been after that? <laughs> As mentioned, Jethro was very kind, and when I told him I had agreed to raise nearly £2 million for an open scanner, and I was worried how I could raise such a big amount, but it would benefit everyone in the West Country who may need it. He said, don't worry, I will help. And he walked from Land's End to his club in Ludown, which was amazing. And with numerous shows in his club as well, it wasn't long before he donated, donated well over 100,000 pounds. Jethro just loved to make people laugh. He was absolutely unique. And what fantastic memories and legacy has he left us all with those so hilarious, wonderful stories. The outpouring of messages from all over the country and abroad, Australia, Canada, the States, and many other countries has been amazing. One person wrote, my dad idolized Jethro and would, would listen to Jethro tapes with tears of laughter running down his face. And when their dad died, the inscription they put on his gravestone was, what happened was, I can't say it like Jethro, sorry. <laughs> How I wish the train would stop Camborne this Wednesday and our lovely Jethro would get off and carry on making us laugh. Sadly, it's not to be. And there never will ever be another Jethro. You gave us so much enjoyment, Jethro. Bless you. Rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, John, not only for that wonderful, wonderful tribute to Jethro, but John, I thank you very much for your bravery because I don't care how many famous people you look after in your lifetime, this is the hardest place in the world to stand and speak of someone you do love and respect so very much indeed. Thank you, John. No pressure later then, Jim. <laughs> I now share a absolutely beautiful piece of prose. It's called Ever Since I Heard the News. And it's written by Paul Jackson. Now, Paul Jackson is a huge, huge fan of Jethro's. And what he has written really does represent the thoughts of all the thousands, thousands of fans out there who love this man. Paul writes, Ever since I heard the news, it hasn't felt the same. Curse this wretched virus, because COVID was to blame. For me, you were just heaven sent. To lose you feels so wrong. But I know as I glance upwards, you're now back where you belong. Oh, I laughed each time I saw you. So much I almost cried. Tears fell once again this week when I heard that you had died. The cream of British comedy, lesser mortals were in all, and every time I saw you, I simply wanted more. How on earth is Pemberthy's feeling? Mr. Taraskis, too. Trains still don't stop in Camborne, but they should have, just for you. Perhaps they changed the schedule to celebrate your time as Cornwall's greatest export for whom I dedicate this rhyme. Your memory will live on through us and all of those who cared.
but more important, will remember the times with you we shared. Thank you, Paul. It's all of our turn to honour Jethro again now as we join the Oggy men in singing our second hymn, Trelawney, the unofficial Cornish anthem. Please stand. Thank you again. Yes, please all be seated as I hand over to Mr. Jim Davidson, OBE. Thank you, Jim.
In Norfolk, they got some deep dikes. <laughs> Those words will be remembered forever as Jethro and I tried unsuccessfully to get through a sketch on the generation game. About eight takes it took. Uh, I know when it's shown on YouTube or on the television, they only showed five of them, but uh, I think there were some bad words said uh, by uh, Jethro and I. And, and I agree with John, his poor suffering manager, that uh, what a pleasure it was to, to have known Jeff. It really was, and he's unique. And, and to hear some of the tributes saying that he was a, a good businessman and was very canny with money. Mm. <laughs> they say, what's the difference between Jethro and a coconut? Well, I believe you can get a drink out of a coconut. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've known Jeff uh, for 40 years. I met him down in the West Country when he was doing warm-ups for a, a show, I think, and then he had his own little bit in a show about pirates. I think it was called Treasure Hunt or something like that years ago, and I could see that he was just brilliant. I thought, I hope I've never got to follow him. And I introduced him to Des O'Connor all those years ago, and, and, and we became great friends and colleagues since then. And just because I introduced him to Des O'Connor, it was you know, no big deal. It's nothing to do with me how Jethro became one of the great entertainers of this country because if I hadn't have introduced him, someone else would. He was that good. He was that different. And he became the biggest DVD seller. He became the richest, the most successful DVD artist of all time. Amazing. And he still cleaned his own windows. There's a story that he was on top of a ladder cleaning his windows once and he dropped 50p out of his pocket. And he, he jumped down the ladder to get it and the 50p hit him on the head. <laughs> Jeffro, Jeffro would have made a good chancellor. If you ever spoke politics to him, and this is not the place to talk politics, but I'll, I'll tell you a story of how Jeffro thought of the economy. And uh, he said, you know, last year, Jim, I paid £600,000 in tax. And there's a bloke lives in Trabogo. He's got three wives, 42 children. They've had to bolt two council houses together. They're all on benefits. And his vote cancels mine. <laughs> he had a point. He also said to one day about John Miles, his great friend and manager, well, he said, I'm getting rid of my manager. Why is that? John's brilliant. Yeah, he's a lovely man. I love him. We'll be friends forever. But it's not as if he's got to phone up anybody and sell me now, is it? Everybody knows where I am. They all know Jethro. So what's the point of him? I said, well, he's your manager. Yeah, but I pay him 20%. I said, well, that's about the norm. Yeah, but you think about this, Jim. Every five years, I do a year for him. <laughs> Oh, oh, seriously, all of us thought about sacking our managers because of that. I remember standing with, uh, with Jethro in the wings at one of his shows down in Torquay. He was, of course, top of the bill, and his support act was Bernie Flint. Wonderful. And I stood with Jethro in the wings watching Bernie Flint, who was brilliant, and he was going down really well, and Jeff said, waste the bloody time in it. I said, what do you mean? He said, I said, he's great. Oh, yeah, he is good. He said, but I put him on so I don't have to be here in the first half, and here I am in the first half watching him. <laughs> I could go on and do that first half and keep that 200 quid. <laughs> That's why he didn't have many support acts. But the other thing that John was absolutely right, he hated hotels, he hated staying away. When I had my theatre in Great Yarmouth, he'd drive up, do a gig, and drive back from Great Yarmouth, albeit in the back of Andy's Land Cruiser. Bless him. He, uh, I said to him once, come on, Jeffro, we're going up north. And we went to a gig in Oldham, and he didn't want to go. It was all up north, and it was all horrible. And he was right, because we both died a terrible death. He went on first and died. And I said, I see you when I come off. 
After 40 minutes, I came off as well, having got no laughs, and I called him up and I said, where are you? He said, Bristol. <laughs> he couldn't wait to get home. He couldn't, he couldn't wait to get home. He was, um... do you know what I was thinking, which makes the man even greater? I never was truly convinced that Jethro was that at home on stage. He knew it was his job and there was no one better than him at all, but I've seen the nervousness of him. He got so nervous. And sometimes how he managed to get on that stage and conquer his fear just makes him all the, the greater in my heart. What he didn't like to do on tour with me was do two nights because it meant he couldn't drive home. And we were in Worthing, which is a lovely place. <coughs> I spent a fortnight there one Tuesday and um, Jethro stayed over in the hotel, didn't like it, got the ump, didn't speak to me and he told me that he is so bored when he got up at six o'clock in the morning, then he had breakfast, then he had another breakfast. He said by 12 o'clock I'd had my hair cut twice <laughs> and what happened was he's walking along just a road in Worthing and there's a man building a porch and like John said with the slabs. Jethro stood there with his pipe watching this bloke sawing some wood and Jethro said, that's not sawing so good, that, is it? Bloke went, do what, mate? He said, I'll sharpen that saw for you. And he sharpened this bloke's saw. And then he started sawing some wood. Within half an hour, Jethro had taken over this job, was bossing this man round, telling him what to do, how to alter this and that. Four hours he was there and the wife brought him out, the husband out a cup of tea as Jethro was leaving. And she said, who was that bloke? He said, I've no idea at all. <laughs> Later that night, that people in that house who built that porch came to see me in Worthing. And in the first half, out walked Jethro. And the bloke said, that's him. <laughs> it's quite amazing. He was a great comic. He was a great comic. Uh, he never really, he never changed from being Jethro. And that's a great thing. Success never altered him at all, really. And he was really, really successful. You must be very, very proud of Jeffro. We're all here in church to celebrate life and the hope, the hope that we'll all meet again somewhere. The hope that we will all meet. And it's just hope that we need to meet Jeffro again. And a lot of people, maybe you are not religious, maybe you just push hope aside. They talk about life after death as something from a science fiction movie. But I hope, and I look at it this way, Jeffro, my old boy. What a caterpillar calls death, a wise man calls a butterfly. So you go fly, Jeff. Thank you. How can we follow that? by saying the Lord's Prayer in Jethro's honour. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. See, Jim Davison has got some self-discipline, hasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> but on behalf of the cathedral, I, I have to declare a, a, a legal um, disclaimer. There is nothing wrong at all 
with northern crowds and audiences, but Worthing is rubbish. <laughs> when we leave the chapel shortly, donations can be given in Jethro's memory, which will benefit uh, Children's Hospice Southwest. And there's a collection box just inside the, the door, and also one outside on the steps. Alternatively, we can send our gifts for the charity, care of the funeral directors, um, Jay Spry's of Lewdown and E. White and Son of Taunton. And I just have a, a few things, tributes to play before I hand back to Canon Allen. I have to pay tribute to Jethro's wonderful, wonderful family. By golly, they have been at absolutely amazing through this terrible, terrible ordeal for them since the 14th of December. We on the outside won't really appreciate what they've been going through. We do feel for you and you've been wonderful. I want to say a big thank you to Yogi Men for leading us in song. Thank you very much indeed, gents. And of course, I want to say thank you to the two gents who have spoken today. And a big, big thank you to all the behind-the-scenes staff here at Truro Cathedral. We can't imagine all the work they have to do to make this event happen so special. Thank you all so very much indeed. You often get forgotten, but we are so, so grateful to you all. And I say a big thank you to Bishop Philip, the, the Bishop of Truro, and to my Bishop Jonathan of the Open Episcopal Church for facilitating this ecumenical service in Jethro's honour to happen. I want to say a thank you to our funeral director, Jonathan, and especially, and he isn't going to thank me for this, a big, big thank you to Andy Reid, because Andy has coordinated all of these elements together to make this special. Thank you. As both John and Jim said, Andy and Jethro travelled the globe together, really, but in the UK mainly. And um, on that note, some of you might be wondering what the brown bag is all about that Sarah placed on Jethro's coffin. Well, I'm going to let you all into a secret that not a lot of people know. Jethro's brown bag has been on every single appearance that Jethro has ever done whether it be from the pub around the corner to the London Palladium and to Highgrove. Now, when that bag started looking a bit sorry for itself, Jethro brought a bigger bag so he could put the brown bag in it and still take it to every single show. And that brown bag has always been with him. And of course, today on Jethro's finale, the brown bag is with him too, and it will be with him on his journey to heaven. Now, a very, only a very few people know exactly what the contents of that brown bag are, and that's going to re remain a secret forever. And now I ask you all to please stand for the commendation. Into your hands, Lord, our faithful creator and most loving redeemer. 
we commend your child Jethro, for he is yours in death as in life. Gather him into your loving arms, that he may enjoy that rest which you have prepared for all those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rain fall gently upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Did you nearly touch a star? Did you cross the Bodmin moors where the grouse and turn fly free? Did you see this land where red rocks and white waters greet the sea? Just to see the lights of New Key, Falmer's busy key. I wandered across the Tamar, now I'm home at last and free. From the demon called ambition, and the phantom called success, and a way of life that made a fool of me. I'm proud that I was born here, it's always home for me. I love this land where red rocks and white waters greet the sea. Did you see Luxillian Valley on a warm September day? See the golden sands of Senan when the tide had rolled away? 
The old tin mines on Camborne Hill, Truro shining spires, Tintagel and St. Morgan, seen the chalk hills and Pentire. I'm proud that I was born here, it's always home for me. I love this land where red rocks and white waters greet the sea. I love this land where red rocks and white waters greet the sea. Greet the sea. Good night, God bless you. Thank you, Phil. Good night. Good night.